So today we're going to talk about this concept that we've actually written a full post on called about landing pages versus blog posts, specifically conversion rates, because this versus like, why would anyone want to like care about landing page versus blog post is all about this idea that has come up in our client work, which is okay, guys. So you're going to go after this like product related keyword, this bottom of the funnel keyword, um, like, you know, best, whatever software shouldn't, why would we rank for that with a blog post? Shouldn't these really product centric keywords be, um, attacked with a landing page or a feature solution page or something because it's product centric. So, and in fact, it's summarized here. We, our post, which is this one, should you target an SEO keyword with blog post or landing page where we go into all this, um, we actually show data because we did this analysis here um, with one of our clients that happened to have a good example where they had like landing pages that were topically extremely similar, similar to blog posts. It's actually really hard to do this kind of analysis, right? Because you can't theoretically, like how, how do you like take a keyword, the same keyword and rank two different things for it in the same spot? You can't. So we had to find a client where we had very closely related keywords, some of which they were using a landing page, some of which using a blog post. And the argue, thing we argued that the blog post conversion rates are actually surprisingly high. That is summarized in the post that's ranking above us only because it has the featured snippet, which is hilarious because it's uh, like, what, what is a featured snippet on this nuanced argument? But it says here, while a blog post offers a glimpse into your company's personality, a landing page converts readers into customers. Now, this is why I hate featured snippets. Why is this outranking us with, it's just such a stupid statement. And yeah, it is a nuanced topic. So we have a whole post digging into arguing both sides and, and trying to come to some conclusion. Yet this simple sentence outranks us, which is really frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, feature snippets should be for like a definition of something, but this isn't like this is a versus two concepts that have a lot of nuance in it. I, just, I don't know what's going on. But anyways, this sentence in this post, in this post, which is sort of like, I don't know, like build, build your blog. What? Why do? Wow. If you click on this, it just opens it full screen. Uh, so th it, this is the entire post. It's from here to here. And, and what it argues is this prevailing attitude that we're hoping this video convinces you is not right or is not right the majority of the time with evidence. So we're going to show actual data, which is that most people think like this. They think the blog is for, you know, this kind of like brand building top of the funnel stuff actually summarized pretty well in this sentence offers a glimpse into your company's personality. Like blog should stay away from business like conversion and a landing page converts readers into customers argument in this in this video is that's not true we're gonna let's talk about blog posts converting readers into customers if you've read or heard anything from us you know that that's kind of what we believe and so we are we have come prepared with stats Comments. lots of stats okay so Lots of stats. And yeah, so we just want to start with conversion rates. What, like, what is a good blog conversion rate? Correct? Yeah. So we'll start by just looking at, um, we're going to do a deep dive into this one client. We've anonymized the client for obvious reasons. Like well, most companies don't want their conversion rate, um, publicized everywhere. It is a B2B SaaS company and it's one that kind of does, I don't know, is it fair to say Benji enterprise deals, but like large 10, 20, 30 K annual deal size type deals. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say it can skew larger than that. So yeah, I would, I would say that's fairly accurate. I would say average yeah. deal deal size is somewhere in the 20 to 30 K range and then can go all the way up to hundred K plus. Yeah. The, the, the point is this is not self-serve. It's like you have to request a demo. So it's that kind of SAS flow versus we'll show a quick thing at the bottom of a B to B. SMB SaaS, which is totally self-serve, like at these costs, right? Take your credit card out, your company, you know, if you have 10 employees, it's going to be 30 bucks a month type of thing. Um, this is not that it's like request a demo and then have like an annual contract. That's pretty big. So as you said, um, 
Benji. So the first thing is, if we're going to counter this idea, landing pages for conversion, blog posts is just to give a glimpse to your personality. I'm so offended by this. Uh, <laughs> is the first thing is like, okay, so like, what are good conversion rates? Like, let's just quantify it if we want to attack this with data or prove or disprove it with data. So first thing is here, we have the leads that our blog posts only. So leads, this is, I think, demo requests. Demo right? requests. Yeah. yeah. So let's define that. Yeah. Demo requests and talking to sales. From our blog posts. And again, there, let's define what does that mean from our blog posts? Um, and, and we have articles on this. We have not done a video on this, but we're talking about first click attribution inside GA. We, we use this thing called the model comparison tool. You can find it on the left-hand side of GA at the very bottom in the conversion kind of drop down in, in universal analytics. Um, yeah. And one the, thing to note on that too, is it's not a perfect measure. And I've seen a lot of people argue this lately that, oh, you shouldn't use attribution tools because it's not perfect. So this definitely undercounts, but it gives us a guiding light. Yeah, well, that's important. It's not perfect in the way that it should not be perfect, which is it undercounts, if anything. Yeah, because if exactly. someone uses a different browser or something and or they read it and their coworker ends up signing up, but your blog post did it, you're not going to see that, but that actually is even more. But the point is, our, the leads have been have been going up. So just know that the raw number of leads has been going up. But this analysis we happened to do actually a, a while ago, many, many months ago, maybe a year ago, because, and, and you can tell the backstory, right? The client was worried about their organic conversion rate. Yeah, they, they were questioning why their organic conversion rate on their site kept dropping and was really low compared to what they thought was good. Uh, but then I think I asked what was good and they didn't really know, but they just felt like the, the number was low, which I feel like is actually typical for a lot of companies. So yeah. oftentimes you, you look at your, your blog conversion rate or your overall organic conversion rate, and you're comparing it to, let's say a paid conversion rate. And so your numbers are going to be like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, something like that compared to, let's say 3% on, on the paid side. And so you look at those channels and you're just like, our blog or, or organic is really low converting. Why is that? So yeah, let's dig into that because I think part of it is just a function of the way that people are measuring this and not segmenting out different parts of their site and different mediums of traffic, uh, which can skew the numbers and make them seem lower and or higher than they should be. Uh, so we want to kind of just dig into how we did this analysis here and talk through the different conversion rates once we segmented different parts of the site. Uh, and yeah. So the first thing is, okay, well, so what are they talking about? So the first thing is we just looked at overall conversions from organic traffic and looked at the conversion rate there. And so what they felt was low was in this range 0.1. And I guess this last month that we did it, um, 0.42. So this is kind of 0.1%, I should say from 0.1% to 0.42 percent but the vast majority of months are just 0.1 to 0.13 okay and, and again I, I think we should define what the conversion is and it's a demo request a demo request and we're looking at this only from organic traffic to their entire site so so then um as you said this the first thing that we wanted to segment out to like dig into what's behind this is extremely common. And I've seen a bunch, we've had a bunch of clients kind of run into this issue, which is, okay, well, where is the majority of this traffic coming from? So, so we know if, again, if you've seen any of our other videos or read anything on our site, everything is about bottom of the funnel. And so we know first things first, look for the like few pages that are getting a massive amount of organic traffic because it always has some 80, 20, or really like 99, one type of rule where there's going to be some behemoth thing. And typically those don't convert really well. And there was, uh, and I'm calling it for privacy's sake, top of the funnel, mega post, you know, yeah, it was, it was a, it, yeah, it was essentially a microsite that they created to rank for a search term. And it was a way for them to try to generate leads as we've mentioned it, it does generate a ton of traffic, but the conversion rate for this entire site is really low. 
And so it really skews the numbers on what's working on the organic side. Yeah. And look at this. I mean, that's the majority of their traffic, like 200,000 of the 241 comes from this thing, this top of the funnel. Also a side note, because I do think that we should bring this up. Um, a, A big reason for doing this analysis too was because I th- I believe it's once a Google Analytics property goes over a hundred thousand sessions per month, and I'll have to double check that in the background, but I th- I think that's the metric. Google Analytics starts to sample the data, and so it doesn't give you an accurate representation of what's actually happening. And yeah. so, even to do this analysis, what we had to do was then go into GA, go into short time periods. So I I think either two weeks or one month. Um, because that hundred thousand metric is within the time frame that you're you're viewing in, and then do all these calculations. So segment the data um, organically, and then uh, these different segments, looking at the, only the microsite, only the homepage, and that kind of stuff. So just wanted to let you guys know that because if you have a lot of traffic to your site, your uh, both your conversions and your traffic. And your organic traffic, if you're looking at GA, um, sometimes it gives you different numbers when you look at the data in different ways. And a lot of people don't know that that could be the reason why. So check that if if your site has a ton of traffic. Okay. So then going back in here, um, this so so this thing had like ultra low conversion rates, which I'm trying to signify with like a darker red color. So point one, I mean, this is the majority of traffic is converting at 0.06 or this month, 0.12% was the conversion rate. The majority of that organic traffic via this one microsite was converting at 0.03, meaning the rest of the traffic must have been converting much higher to get that 0.03 up to 0.12. So when we look at our posts, again, these bottom of the funnel posts with this many leads per month, and we look at our posts, it's converting, which is green here, really high, 2.4, 2.7, 1.5, 1. 1.8. So it's dramatically different. Now, I mean, one thing I want to be clear about and not give the wrong impression is the raw number of leads is still lower. So like in this case, their top of the funnel thing, as you said, is not just a post. It is an entire microsite. And even though their conversion rate is so low here, the volume is so unbelievably high that it's still generating a good amount of raw conversions. And I, and I think this is a bit of an aside, but these videos, we love to do these asides is I think there's a, sometimes a misconception, at least in conversations we get into on Twitter or some reactions, um, to the stuff we say of like, Grow and convert thinks you should never do top of the funnel. And it's like, that's ridiculous. We're literally doing YouTube videos um, like this that are not like ranking for our, our own business for just like content marketing agency, right? So like, it's not that we don't believe in that. There is a place for it. We just think you should quantify it. And I will say the vast majority of companies do not like, will not have a single content asset like a microsite that generates hundreds of thousands of organic visitors every month to it. I have almost never seen it. So this is absurdly high traffic for a single asset. And yeah, and so if you can produce that and produce this many leads a month, even though the conversion rate is low, all the power to you, you should do that. But just keep in mind for the majority of companies, your top of the funnel asset is going to be going after these like general beginner tip keywords, like 10 tips for this and how to do this beginner level. And you're like, well, it's a B2B uh, client and they're advanced. And you're like, like, it's none of the honest, it's not generating anything. The majority of top of the funnel posts we see in client analytics produce like zero to five signups, sales form fill outs demo request fill outs or whatever a month. So this is definitely an anomaly, but we should call it out for what it is, which is it is producing a good number of raw conversions, even though it has an extremely tiny conversion rate. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair. And then the, the flip side to that, I, and also what led to this analysis is then if you just look at our lead numbers compared to overall 
total conversion numbers besides Here. September uh, on the overall side, that seems yeah. like an anomaly. We somewhat get uncomfortable about our own results because we're saying, okay, if we're only generating 34 demo requests and the whole site is at like 200, is that making a meaningful difference? And I think the answer becomes clearer than once you start segmenting this this data and starting to see where the conversions are coming from. Because if you're not segmenting out branded search, so people that already know about the product, yeah, it, it can make your data look a lot worse than it actually is. Because a yeah. majority of these total conversions are coming from the homepage. And yeah. so it, if we're trying to isolate our marketing channel or campaign or whatever it is and, and say, how are we doing relative to all the other marketing act activities and you're measuring compared to just branded search, I mean, everything's going to look a lot worse. But when you look at the numbers like this and you're saying, okay, we're generating, let's say 20 or 30 um, compared to 100, 110. Okay. Now we're making 20% of overall site conversions, maybe 15%. It, it, it actually does make a meaningful difference. Yeah. I, so just depending on the marketing savvy level of the people listening. So just let me just define a few things. So by branded search, Benji means like looking at conversions. It, it, that if include... people search for grow and convert and ended up on our homepage, that yeah. would be basically what's in this blue column yeah. right here. Yeah, which for an agency, that sounds like a little bit sillier, but like you can imagine for product-based companies, if you're QuickBooks and on the marketing team and you're, and you're looking at um, organic conversions and conversions of different channel and you're comparing to overall and a huge chunk because you have so much, like something like QuickBooks, Salesforce, Airbnb. I mean, these brands have so much brand clout, but this also translates to smaller brands. Branded search is any term, organic terms that involves that word QuickBooks in the search term. QuickBooks versus this, QuickBooks pricing, QuickBooks this and that. Uh, if you're looking at signups from that, of course, signups from that is going to be huge. It's people that are already aware of your brand, right? Some of them might just type it in and press enter too early without pricing .com, and it might as well have been direct traffic. And so that that's what Benji means is like, that is so high. What, I mean, you could say it's, it's almost unfair to compare and you say, well, unfair, you're just trying to make your job easy. No, like l literally the rest of the job of, of marketing is of course, the people that know us, there's going to be a decent conversion rate. What we're doing as marketers is trying to get signups from everyone else. And from an SEO perspective, then our job is literally like, well, what about the people that don't know us? Why don't we rank for keywords that they would Google? And so if you're then comparing to people that already know you, that's ridiculous. And so when we segmented that out here for this client, it was homepage organic traffic. We, we figured it, it's not easy in GA or possible in GA to segment out all branded search because GA is not going to show you all keyword, um, all keywords that are inside organic, right? If you go into organic and look at keywords, the majority will always be parentheses, not set. And so you can't really see like exactly what keyword, how many people, what landing page, how many conversions, but as a proxy, we can use organic traffic to the homepage. Why? Because the majority of organic traffic to most companies, in this case, SaaS companies, homepages is branded search. So that's kind of like a proxy of that. Yes, some people's homepage also will rank for some non-branded category term, right? It'd be like QuickBooks optimizing their homepage. And that yeah, and, and some account. of the people that go to the homepage and type in your brand name might have read an article first. So it's not a perfect measure, but I yeah. think it just... But it's something. It, and so the homepage yeah. itself is generating 100 off of this amount of traffic, a hundred sign up demo requests a month off of this amount of traffic leading to like a conversion rate range between what 1.3 and like in one month, basically 2%, but the majority of these months are like 1.3, 1.6, 1.8%. And so if I plotted the two down here, we can zoom in, zoom in. Um, and here, so people can see it. 
these bottom of the funnel blog posts are converting right on the same level between one and two and a half percent. And in fact, we have three months, four, five, one, two, three, four, five months where we're higher than the homepage, meaning like these terms written for and ranked for by blog posts, not landing pages, are converting at or above by conversion rate perspective, the home page, which gets mostly branded for search traffic, home pages organic traffic conversion rate, because it mostly gets branded search and is a home page, meaning there's like a big request demo button in the hero unit. It's like <laughs> there's like CTAs all over the place. And so this going back to the beginning of our conversation, this idea from this post of a blog offers the glimpse into personal your company's personality while a landing page converts readers into customers is yeah, it's not, just true. not true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not true. It's like this blog post is actually converting well. And then if you look at these numbers by conversion rate versus the other things we talked about, this top of the funnel mega post and all organic traffic, I mean, it's just, those are like just blips on this radar. Again, from a conversion rate perspective. Now, um, we can then do a final example here, but before we get into what we were gonna do in this video, that's pretty interesting is we're gonna look at specific keywords now, not from these clients, cause we don't wanna identify like clients whose conversion rates we're showing, but we'll look at examples from other client work we've done of individual blog posts ranking at the top or near the top and then versus other people's feature solution landing page style posts ranking elsewhere and, and, and talking through that. But before we do that, just to show a separate example, we're talking about B to SMB here, client number two, still SaaS, much lower price point, much higher lead numbers. So this, we're talking about a free trial sign up, and right now averaging something on the order of 200 from our blog post alone, directly attributable to our blog post is 200. So the actual number is much higher. There, we see conversion rates blog wide. I mean, we're talking at this point, for this client, I mean, how many must we have have like 60 posts yeah probably something like that yeah and just like i don't know how much traffic um so this is solid like numbers behind it between two and three percent overall there are individual posts that convert much higher for example in our you know well-known pain point seo post in this screenshot i show on almost every one of these videos the bottom post here that i always talk about with the high conversion rate shows 4.3 percent conversion rate. So individual blog posts can be even higher, but I wanted to show this as an example to say like, there are many just like, I like think, this I think range. there's some for this company that are ranking 10 plus percent. Yeah. Um, and so let's get into those specific, but, but yeah, like the whole point is this one to three, two to three percent conversion rate from traffic to blog posts to free trial signups or demo requests. And actually we should pause there for a second. It's clear now, but I wanna emphasize when we talk about conversion rates, we're talking about two product signups, demo, sales form, free trial. We are absolutely not talking about what I'm gonna call like content conversions, which is put my email in to get a white paper or an ebook or join the newsletter. A lot of brands and marketing teams count that as like a conversion and then like some SDR sales team like works that list, quote unquote, like basically emails people a, a thousand times asking for a demo. No, that's a much more low intent conversion, quote unquote. So we're talking about product conversions, one to 3%. Um, and that's great. And I think majority of people assume that that's not possible. And then this first graph here in this first example, compared to the homepage saying like, that's pretty good. That's actually really good uh, to prove this statement. Like, blog is only a glimpse into, glimpse into your personality is not true. Commentary, well, Benji. Otherwise, let's get yeah, into some, some one examples. one other thing on that spreadsheet that we might want to cover because it's something that I noticed, and I'm sure people are going to wonder this too. If we go back to the other example, uh, here the la oh down the last one. Yep, I I just noticed someone might ask, why is the conversion rate dropping over time? And that's also just because of our strategy. So we, 
we say we're going to go after the really bottom of the funnel post first. And as we start to exhaust those, we'll move up the funnel. And so naturally, as you move up the funnel, the conversion rate will drop because you're going to start generating more traffic and the conversion rate per blog post will be lower. And so the average drops. So just wanted to mention that because it's something that caught my eye. And I'm sure other people are wondering like, oh, well, you had a 4% conversion rate or near near 4% some of those months. And now it seems to be dropping below too. Why is that? That's why. And in those early months, conversion rate is just kind of settling to the mean. I mean, you're just, th this is based on small amounts of data, like a few conversions. But yeah, over time, you accumulate more traffic. It's not going to be quite as targeted as the beginning. But you see that despite that conversion rate drop, first of all, I would say this is hel holding pretty steady minus some issues in the last month. And then the overall number is increasing, which is awesome. Yeah. Also something that we didn't cover um, that I think we should cover in this is just what is a good conversion rate? We didn't really talk about that because we get that question all the time. What are some of the averages that we, we see across the site? Just what is a good conversion rate for a blog post? I'd feel pretty comfortable saying a good conversion rate is 1% plus. And so we typically see our bottom of the funnel blog posts convert at 1% plus. Whereas it, when we've measured conversion site wide, so companies that have a mixed strategy or tend to focus more on bottom of the funnel, I mean, sorry, top of the funnel, we, we see conversion rates site wide of 0.25% uh, from organic. Uh, fr from a blog post. So when we measure blog conversion rates and, and that or less sometimes, yeah, or less. And so that's pretty dead on with what we saw here when we analyzed their whole site conversion rate was somewhere in like the 0.1 to 0.25. That's pretty typical. And so I know we get that question all the time. What is good? Plus 1% is, is good for a blog post. And then sub like 0.5% is pretty typical. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree in fact, but maybe I would be even more harsh. Like I think if you're targeting a buying keyword, bottom of the funnel keyword, like if you're under a percent, like 1% is like, for me, it's almost the expectation. Yeah. And like good would be like two plus. I'm being conservative here. Talking about is blog Y even for yeah. the first client. I mean, how many blog posts have we produced for them? Like over yeah, 50, a lot. Yeah. So across 50 blog posts, we're d doing like 2% plus in this last month, but even here 1%. So for an individual blog post, I mean, the majority of people that we talk to, whether it be companies, clients, or just um, people in our course, in our community that read our blog and are doing this individually or for their own clients or for their own employer, they're just starting it. You know, they're like, okay, what should be the first, you know, the last video we did was like, what should be your first few blog posts? Your first few blog posts should be some of the most high buying intent keywords <laughs> because otherwise then why, why aren't those the keywords you're doing for those? I would expect at least 1%. I mean, for example, this screenshot, this is 4.3%. Um, so yeah. And then, and then the other thing is this graph I was thinking was to help answer this question of what is good because it's using this homepage organic traffic conversion rate as a benchmark. So if your blog posts that are going off to after non-branded terms are getting organic conversion rates of at least that. So it's like, this has two disadvantages. The green line is blog posts that are going after non-branded terms. Whereas we know majority of homepage organic traffic is branded for almost every company. Second disadvantage, this is second supposed, let's put it quote unquote disadvantage that people think as per, you know, that where we started in the video is that the homepage is built to convert. It will always have a CTA at the top. It's like sparse language. It's like selling features and people think blog posts are not converting. That person thinks the blog posts are about showing your company's personality. So it's two supposed disadvantages and yet it's converting on that order. You know, that's my argument is that that's pretty good. Yeah, that's perfect. Cause I also think there's a perfect tie into them, the landing page versus blog post debate because I don't know. I don't know where this number came from, but I've always heard the same number since I've been in marketing, which is landing pages convert at 3% benchmark. Like, is that number even true? 
I, I don't know because I don't yeah. know where the data has come from, but that's the number I've heard for 10 plus years now. And so if we're saying landing pages convert at on average 3% and our blog posts are somewhere in the two to 3% range plus, because we're saying average across everything. Um, again, that, that kind of disproves that landing pages convert better than blog posts just alone, just in the data that we've shown so far. But yeah. I want to keep the conversation going here because I think there's a lot of nuance to this debate. Uh, for example, can you even get your landing page to rank for the keyword that you want to target? Uh, does it convert better? There's all these different questions that we need to answer. So, so that's a perfect segue into looking at some examples because if you're, you know, what you just said is no blog. I mean, we just are proving that blog posts can convert at this two, 3% plus. So now the next question is, well, why? So I think what's behind people like this guy's statement of blogs are not for conversion when, when it's time to convert, use a landing page. It is, you know, let, let's unpack the assumptions there. Um, what, what are the assumptions? I guess he just, it's, it's like, it's just like kind of a fake uh, assumption. No, I, like, I, I think it, it, I think it's just, I'm trying to think of the word, but, uh, what inertia I, it, or I don't even know if that's the right word, but essentially yeah, people so have the been old belief. Continuing yeah, it's, it's, exactly. So I don't, I don't think anyone has really challenged these assumptions or done the analysis themselves. And so they'll repeat what they've heard that landing pages are the best way to convert someone. And I yeah. think that's likely true here that people just have historically produced top of funnel blog posts. They haven't really made up a meaningful amount of conversions. And so people, assume that landing pages convert better and having done this analysis now and doing this analysis when we got challenged by a client because that's how this whole blog post came up was yeah. we had a, ch a client challenge us as uh, some new person at a company came in and said well why are you going after these keywords when we could go after them with landing pages because landing pages convert better than blog posts and we're like well hold on is that true, is that, is that true? So we, we did the digging and got the data and did the analysis and we came back and we said, well, that's actually not true or it may not be true. And so having that assumption and going down that path may not make sense here. And so, yeah, I, I think in your inertia comment, like I, I, I'll just say, I think there's a reason, which is it goes back to kind of the fundamental difference of grow and convert and, and what we say in, in almost all of our content, which is, I think people are just in the habit of using blog posts for non conversion related marketing. They use it to announce like news. They yeah. use it to do random top of the funnel brand building. So like, sure, if you're QuickBooks and, and instead of using a blog post to rank for best small business accounting tools, which is very high product intent. If instead you use your blog, which by the way, a company the size of QuickBooks into it probably does use their blog like this. If instead it's like QuickBooks, like the, the blog on growing your small business and it's just like random small business growth tips. Of course, it's not going to convert a lot. Like, of course, the only purpose of that is to show your company's personality. So it's like, if you continue to use it for non-conversion stuff, it's not going to convert. It's not a surprise. <laughs> like, that's the reason there's an inertia is they're, they're still using it in that way. Yeah, but So now let's actually transition into these SERPs and say, well, what do the details look like? How are these posts written and structured when we are ranking via blog posts for buying and product related search terms. So first example from our client Geekbot, who by the way, is also paying for ad space on this term. The term is Slack retrospective bot. Quick thing on Geekbot is it allows us, we're also a user of Geekbot. We have been using it for years, uh, every single week, but is it allows us allows teams to do these stand up meetings where they ask these three questions. What'd you do today? What'd you do yesterday? What are you going to, what's, what's your progress? No. What did you do? 
what did you accomplish today? What are you going to do tomorrow or something like that? And then what are your obstacles that people used to do in literal physical stand up meeting, standing up so it doesn't take a lot of time. You can do that over Slack. The Slack bot asks those questions, employees respond, and you can put all the responses in a single channel so that managers, other employees and team members can see and be like um, on the same page of what everyone's working on and issues that they're running into. Um, a retrospective is kind of like that, but it's not a daily question. It's when a project um, or I guess like some code push, so it comes from some agile world, uh, is done. Then you, you go back and you ask this series of questions and there are some recommendations of what those questions should be. But again, instead of doing it in person or over Zoom um, with GeekBot, you can do it in Slack. It asks that people answer it on their own time. It's asynchronous and it puts it into a, a channel for like record keeping. So if we look at, so this is a buying term, like you're, they're literally looking for a Slack bot that does retrospectives. They're ready to like choose something, right? They're not like researching or whatever. I mean, they're researching products, but they're, it's not some how to. If we look at it, obviously the word Slack is in the term. There's Slack like app directory pages that if we click into, it literally just goes to that apps. Like you can like download it and attach it to your Slack, right? So this is not like a page, but, uh, and we're ranking, our post, blog post is ranking above it. I'll dissect ours in a second. But then we do have another blog post from a competitor, Stand Up Lee, but we have now Team Retro, which is some other company with their Slack integrations page to basically show the same thing. Okay, on the number, what, four spot. A GitHub uh, page of another like retro bot, retrorabbit.io, which seems like they literally do this exact thing, is they help it, you do retro. It may be the only feature. So, I mean, this is actually a good point right here because I think this is how most companies think. So the pushback that we would get to uh, producing a blog post for this keyword would be, well, isn't it better to get my homepage to rank for this? Or yeah. isn't this, wouldn't it be better if I could get my feature page on my site that's conversion oriented to rank for this keyword term? And wait, wait hold on. Why? Why do they think that? Because, because they, well, because they think it's going to convert at a much higher rate than getting your blog post to. Yeah. Because they think, look, the homepage looks them. like this. Like it start a free trial. Like this, this is the path in which we would want someone to actually start. So yeah. They assume better conversion. But, but, right. there, but there's two issues with that. So one is, can can you even get your homepage to rank number one for this query? Right. And and there's a lot of nuance to that too. There's there's all different things. So one thing I'll say on that is that most landing pages and home pages are built to convert and not to rank. So they have somewhat competing objectives. In order to rank for this keyword, you need to include certain content, certain arguments on your page. And most companies aren't willing to add the content that might be needed in order to get this page to rank for the query that you're going after. And so even just there, you're at a disadvantage compared to many of the blog posts. And then the second thing, is, is kind of the whole topic of this is it, it might not necessarily be true that the blog, that the homepage or the features page will convert at a higher uh, rate than the blog post. And why is that? For me personally, I, I think blog posts often that are focused around a specific query argue how to solve a problem for that specific specific query better than a general home page or a landing page might. Uh, they also add additional context. There's a, a lot of different reasons why a blog post may convert at a higher rate, but I, all we're trying to say is don't necessarily make the assumption that if my home page ranks for this keyword is going to convert at a higher rate and that you can outrank a blog post or a different type of page with your homepage or a feature page. Yeah. I mean, put simply, do you think Google is algorithm is going to put retro rabbits homepage above Slack three Slack pages for Slack retrospective bot? Maybe 
I'm sure there are examples that you could pull up where that happens, but not likely. But we got ours up there. <laughs> Is that too cocky to say? Like, and so anyway, so we have these. But but Benji's point is is um, good is like if this is your home page and you're like, well, listen, Slack retrospective bot, we're noticing that there's intent and concepts. You're maybe using a tool like ClearScope or you're just like analyzing the SERP on your own, the search engine results page, page one. And you're like, okay, there's a people also ask. And you just think, okay, to really match the search intent of this term, we need X, Y, Z concepts. You're going to convince your CMO, CEO, directors to add all that to your homepage, which is like usually a really like fought after thing where like real, the real estate on your homepage, like everyone's fighting over what to put on there. Like, no, they're not going to add a bunch of crap to their homepage to rank for something, but you can add whatever you want to a blog post. So then if we look at what, what did we actually write in our blog post? How do we do it? The big key, I mean, analyzing our blog posts is probably going to be either the next video we do or one of the subsequent videos. So I don't want to get into it in a large extent, but the big thing I want to scroll and show you is our blog posts sell the client's product. And again, I think behind all of these assumptions is most people think, well, blog posts are not supposed to. And in fact, sometimes there's this culture in content marketing that it's bad. Oh no, that's too salesy. We don't want to be too salesy in our blog posts. Blog posts are meant for education and giving value, right? We're like, no, they're not. Not if, I mean, it can be, but if your whole, if you're trying to rank it for a term where someone is looking or comparing products, your blog post should compare and sell your product because that's literally what they're asking for. So the big takeaway here, if we look at this, is the whole concept is the title is how to use a Slack retrospective bot, okay, to run good retrospectives. But immediately, we don't hide anything. We're saying we're gonna this blog post. We're gonna talk about how scrum teams use Geekbot and how Geekbot works. And then as you scroll through the post, it's literally a how-to, like, this is how this works. This is why you can do this. Check this out. This is really cool. And so it's a sales pitch. I, I've said before in other contexts, a lot of these blog posts we write, the benefit of them is they, to some extent, are a demo in written form that thousands upon thousands of people who are Googling things every month, who are Googling things that indicate they're in the market for your product will be seeing. It's like basically getting your demo in front of way more people than the people who actually request one. So look at the screenshots and I'm scrolling through the text, but if you read these, uh, the text, like usually we sell things in a similar format, like here are issues. Here's how we do it. Here's why we do it this way. Here's how we design this product this way or do our service this way. And, and so it, it, it sells. The blog post sells stuff. So that's kind of key example number one. So as a second example, I want to look at something we did um, for a former client, Scribe Media, who writes books uh, for people. It's like ghostwriting is one aspect of it. Actually, it's a huge aspect of it. But if you want to get your book written and you're not a professional author or any kind of author, and you're just like someone who did something cool or a business owner that wants to use book for marketing purposes, they can help you write your book in a variety of different ways. So a definite bottom of the funnel keyword for them is memoir ghostwriting services, because the majority of their clients, their books are memoirs of sorts, right? Someone accomplishes something great, uh, or what have you, and wants to use a book to grow their brand. Um, and that's a memoir of sorts. We're ranking number one for them for memoir ghostwriting services with this book, how to choose a memoir ghostwriting services for with your that book, blog, this book, by the way, with that blog, yeah. <laughs> with this entire book we wrote for them. Um, but if we look at the other things and I'll go in and dissect this and look at it just the way we looked at the Geekbot example is we have a bunch of other services with, I believe, all feature pages. Yep. So this is ghostwriting cert dot services. Oh, no, this is kind of a blog post. I don't uh, know what you call this. Uh, uh, it's, it's a wordy landing, landing page. page. Yeah, it's a landing yeah. page. 
this, this, this is one of those landing pages where they, they did make that concession where they decided to add more content to the page to try to get this yeah. to rank. And it, and it seemingly worked. So. This is not a horrible idea. Like, I don't know what you think. I mean, I think this is a good compromise. For sure. Because, like, in, in the end, what does it really mean? Like, this definition, whoa, they have a lot of pop-ups. Um, but, wow. Okay, this is so funny. Yes, I do. What? That's so funny. Okay, that's annoying. But, but, oh my goodness. <laughs> so, okay, that's not, I don't know if that's helping their conversion rate or not. And it's literally making noise. But, like, I'm not even going to keep it up. But <laughs> that was great. What this, it's a decent concession. Because in the end, like, what is it? Landing page versus blog post, like, at, at some point, those things can merge. If you just take a landing page and you add a bunch of text to it, like, is it really that different? Does it really matter if it's on slash blog or not? No, it's a page on your site that's ranking for a term that has conversion intent. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and we've done that for some clients where we've produced a blog yeah. post. So written content that we think needs needs to be on the page in order to rank. And then the company then took all that content and reorganized it in, in the format of a landing page. Yeah, that actually begs a good question. I don't think we've sat down, if we have the data, or at least I haven't seen it, of whether the conversion rate actually goes up when they have done that. That would yeah, be great I, for this I, kind of that analysis. Would. Um, but I just, while you were saying that, so I just opened up these three, and it's more of the same. It's like ghostwritingfounder.com. Um, and again, this is a landing page. Again, it's like decently wordy for a landing page, but it's selling the services. And this is by the book what SEO firms would tell you, what marketers would tell you. And this is for sure a landing page, right? It has like quintessential stuff on the left, form right on the right, all above the hero unit. Like someone looks like they A-B tested this. They were like, let's put some security logos on there. Um, wow, they got some text effects. What is this, 1994? Wow, why is it all flying at me? Um, so for sure, a, a, a writing, a landing page, and then ghostwords.com. I will make a point about the conversion rate on a page like this. If I was just researching different companies and I came across a blog post that gave me a bunch of information on what to look for in these services, tried to help me make the decision, sold me why they're the best, I would probably be more likely to fill out the form after reading that than I would if I knew nothing about the company and they just had some basic info in a form, I don't know that I'm ready to talk to someone yet. I I'm still yeah. probably in the research phase. And I, and I think that could be another reason why the conversion rate on a blog post could be higher than just a yeah. landing page. I, I've seen this debated in CRO circles and like anything in marketing, like it depends, right? Like I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense in this case. Because look at this, like scribe, but we're going to get into here. So let's look into our post. But case in point, I think in the post, it says somewhere it's like $50,000 or something. It's like $48,000. So like, you know, and this is a purchase where you're not going to be writing a bunch of memoirs. You're only writing one memoir. <laughs> so it's a big decision. So what you said makes a lot of sense. Like you got to be damn sure you're going with the company that like you want to go with. that's going to help ghost write your memoir. But like... For some of these, like, oh, I'm going to request a demo of five different SaaS companies because I was told by my boss that we need to pick a new, you know, like content management software or something like, you know, like those paid search landing pages. Maybe you don't need to say a lot and you just put that on there or whatever. So, but I, I hear what you're saying. And I think there probably are a non-negligible amount of businesses in particular services like this, not like products or like me too products that you it is more compelling to read about it and so again here's ours how to choose a memoir ghostwriting service for your book so first things first we're ranking number one as you pointed out on the geekbot example like yes they have these but let's just think about it like most people say what the number one listing gets on average 34 percent of clicks and then i think it goes to like 15 nine eight like and well, it drops I would, significantly. I would say especially when you're above the people also asked too. So basically yeah. we're on an island up there. Yeah. So first things first, if you think it converts higher, how much higher? Because you're probably getting three X the clicks here at number one. So you're getting three X the traffic 
then number five, number four, and I, I'm just that's a ballpark you can look up. There's a bunch of SEO companies that like publish this data on on the clicks by position, but it's something on that order. I think the first one's like thirty something percent, and I think down here you're in like definite single digits, maybe low single digit percentages. So if your like landing page only makes it to position eight already, you're like, well, better convert like. 5x better than a blog post in order to make up for that traffic loss. Then when we look into the blog post, just like the Geekbot example, but this one goes even more explicit and more educational because it's a survey. It outlines what should you be looking for in a memoir ghostwriter. And it like carefully outlines this. And this is not BS fluff copy. We do extensive interviews with the actual experts that do ghostwriting or manage the process at the client organization, in this case, Scribe, and write down their thoughts. Um, you know, I mean, we turn it into a post. The two types. So this is like now educational. Like you're saying, if, if you wanted to actually find a ghostwriting service, this is actually helping you understand like what's at your disposal as opposed to this. <laughs> and then the best part that I wanted to get to was how Scribe's memoir ghostwriting service is different and what it includes. There are five core things that separate Scribe's ghostwriting service. Number one, number two, number three, it costs this much. So like, again, I wanna emphasize what I said on the Geekbot example, a good bottom of the funnel blog post is like a demo or a sales call in the form of a blog post. Yeah. So that's why that's you a great have point. a good chance of converting. That, yeah, that's a great point. Think about the conversion difference between someone who's read this entire post, understands the cost and all the differentiators who's filling out the form versus that other landing page that had the 50% off discount. Like, yeah. it, it doesn't give any context about the service. You still, the, still, the person might be still in research phase, so it doesn't indicate necessarily buying intent. That it yeah. could just be, I want to talk to a salesperson and could be turned off by the discovery call. So the, the, the quality of conversion is, is much higher coming from a post like this. Yeah, exactly. That's what, what you're saying is reminding me of is that's actually an analytics challenge is we're looking and even we're not doing this. Like we're looking at this whole thing. This whole video today is about counting the number of leads by conversion rate. We mean like how many? We're not even talking about the quality of them, but you make a good point. If someone just comes in and fills out a little form above the fold with a bunch of random logos and crap all over your landing page, like what's the quality versus someone who read about everything that you like differentiates your service, why, what it includes, or in the Geekbot example, they read all those, see all those screenshots, see exactly how to do it. Like, and they sign up likelihood is pretty good that they're like a, a, a decent lead. So at this point, we can, I mean, I can share one of the last examples, but it's going to be more of this. So this is, uh, I think, a blog post that I actually worked on or edited with one of our writers um, for a longstanding client, TapClix, which makes marketing analytics software, but for enterprise marketing agencies. And here we're ranking number one for omni-channel. reason for omni-channel, then that's a really good keyword for them, is because enterprise marketing analytics, what they specialize in is for firms being able to handle and easily digest and analyze data from when you're doing like radio ads and podcast ads and TV broadcast and digital Facebook, Google, you know, this and that. So you have a ton of different marketing, the stuff affects itself, like whether you're doing radio ads and a geography affects how your like Facebook CPC is and your client is spending like a million dollars a month. Like there's just this mass of data that is the, not the same as analyzing like your three campaigns on Google search, like Google ads. Um, and so omni-channel reporting uh, is there. And, you know, again, here we have like ameo.com. We have Salesforce apps in the Salesforce app exchange ranking here. Um, and we're, so first things like, again, nuance.com, nuance insights, like this is clearly a product solution page. Wow, McKinsey's on here. But anyway, the point is there are, again, a bunch of landing pages ranking below us. We're ranking number one. Of course, we're you know we're, we're showing you they're ranking number one. Doesn't mean you're going to rank every time number one with a blog post. That's ridiculous. But again, this is an example on a product side that does something very similar to the scribe post we talked about. Like just like the scribe post starts off and is like, let us help you understand the market. 
what you should basically be looking for in a memoir ghostwriter. This says like, what is this is, you know, because the Serb demanded it. And then it lays out kind of the, the struggles, why most the pain points, like what the situation is, why most reporting tools struggle with it. So what do most reporting tools have? Why is that hard? And then it says basically here, there's three characteristics, a good tool, just like memoir ghostwriting says must have qualities it says a good tool needs to be able to do these things. And it sells the heck out of tap clicks. This is what we do instantly connect screenshots, videos, like YouTube videos from tap clicks factor number two, YouTube videos. And because this is an account that I actively work on with or worked on with some of our members of our team, well, you know, the conversion stats better than I do, but I'm pretty sure omni-channel reporting is converting for them. Like yeah. Decently well. yeah, it's one of the ones that brings in conversions. Yeah. So, I mean, those are the extents of the examples, but I think, I hope if you've made it to the end of the video, like this idea in this featured snippet, which pisses Benji off of a blog post offers a glimpse into your company's personality, a landing page converts readers into customers. You see that that is one, not true and two old fashioned thinking. And it's really about what converts is any page that is ranking highly for conversion focused keywords. And I hope we've convinced you that we made an argument. You can do that with a blog post. And one, it gives you a lot more room to rank. Cause if you're not ranking in the top few spots, you're not getting much traffic from it anyway. It doesn't matter what your conversion rate is. If you're on page two of Google, I want to say this clearly. If you're on page two of Google, I don't care what your page looks like or what its conversion rate is because a great conversion rate times zero traffic is still zero. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. So that's number one. And number two, so one blog posts give you a great chance of ranking because you don't have these restrictions of what you can put in there. And number two, you can sell the heck out of your product or service in a blog post, and you can basically turn your blog post into a written static demo or sales meeting and just sell it and it'll convert well. And we've shown you the data for that.